our young people, our young people from our Sunday school are going to give a condition for you this morning that we ask for you. You pray for them as they come, for they shall tell the story. They shall tell the story. Amen? Amen? We put you in the hands now. Scott, <laughs> won't you come? a monologue um, given from the perspectives of Mary Magdalene, Peter, Thomas, and John. It is entitled From Our Church. I have seen the Lord. You don't seem surprised. You are thinking, Mary Magdalene, of course you've seen the Lord. You walked with him daily after he healed you. That's not what I mean. I saw him risen, alive. You might not know how I felt. I was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus gave Mary and John to each other. Who did I have? No one. I was there when he said, I'm thirsty, and they gave him a swab of vinegar. What could I do? Nothing. I was there when he said, it is finished. Who would have thought it would come to that? A dead man on a cross? God forsaken. Was this the glory he had intended? Was this God's way of acting? God forsaken, alone, lonely. As a daughter of Jerusalem, the one thing I had learned was to mourn. I loved him. I had followed him. I would stay with him when the Sabbath was over, of course. I thought the worst had happened until I got to the tomb that morning. The stone had been moved. They couldn't even leave a body in peace. Surely the master had deserved a proper burial. Later I wondered why I hadn't walked right in. Instead, I ran to tell the others what they had done to our teacher and our friend's body, Peter, and the beloved ones left running. But I couldn't stay still long enough for them to return. I set out again. Why, you ask? Mm -hmm. To cry, of course. Near to his last resting place, or to find out where he was taken. Now I had the courage to look in, and two messengers guided us. Would you ask a visitor at a gravesite why she is crying? I was lonely, without Jesus. He meant everything to me. Then the gardener came and asked the same thing, adding, Whom are you looking for? Looking for just a body to give a proper burial now that it has been desecrated. Then a wonderful thing happened. Mary, the gardener knew my name. No one knew me that well and loved me so much as Jesus. Mary, he had told us once that he calls the sheep by his own name and they know his voice. Teacher and master, I wanted to cling to him forever, not ever to enter such despair again, but I couldn't. His words were beautiful. Go to my sisters and brothers and tell them that I am on my way to my father and your father to my God and your God. Equality, love, unity. He was one with us. Not only was I free from that despair, but I knew this was not only a teacher of Israel, the Lord. God has acted in this Jesus. I have seen the Lord. always stuck to where the angels feared to train, you might say, but I'm a rock, perhaps not easily broken. At least that's what the master told me when he called me Peter. And I have seen the Lord, not right away, of course. I had chosen to stay with my best friends. We might as well be together in this mess as spread throughout the city. I had told them we lost track of each other through the trial, that black night, that rich night. You know things look different at nighttime. I had to defend Jesus, and he wouldn't allow it. My rule isn't of this word, or else my servants would fight. That's the rumor of what he said. All right, no fighting. What was there to do? I'm not very sentimental, except, of course, that night. By the time we hit midnight, and things had gone from bad to worse, I couldn't handle it anymore, alone, discouraged, and frightened. I've never, seen, I've never been a follower of Jesus. What I really wanted to do was to save my life 
as I could teach others later, you see. After three denials, I wept. I had no more tears left when Mary of Magdalene told us that now the body had been removed. I ran as fast as I could to check everything, and you know what I'm like, barged right in, to find the burial clothes lying there. This was no abduction. What was it? It didn't make sense until he came to where we were, locked into a fear and powerlessness. He came. Peace be with you. Was it the words? No. It was the presence that danced. A very great joy settled into each one of us. Peace be with you. Now there was a reason to live. This was the Lord. We didn't need to go by Mary's story. The Lord had come to all of us, gathered here. The Lord has returned to us to restore, to restore us into his presence. New power, new presence, new deeper relationship. I didn't have to brag boldly anymore about not leaving him or his not suffering. Even when the worst has happened, the Christ has came to us. We have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. You might think that someone like myself doesn't deserve to see, because I'm Thomas, the one who demanded not only to see, but also to touch. Perhaps you don't want to hear the voice of a doubter, but I'm more than that. I am more than my doubts and questions. You see, I loved Jesus. I was more ready than the others to make that dangerous trip back into the vicinity of Jerusalem, where the crowds had actually started to stone Jesus. That Jesus, he had no fear. His presence inspired courage, so I spoke up loyally. Let us also go that we may die with him. The dying part. Well, it turned out that Jesus was master of life. Lazarus was raised. It was so clear. I knew for sure. Until he himself was killed. Apparently, willingly, it wasn't so clear at all. I was the one who pointed out to Jesus that the teaching wasn't as self-evident as he seemed to think. We didn't know where he was going, and he said he was on the way. What a way, what a life. I need to be sure. The, the others had tried to reassure me by saying that they had seen the Lord, but I'm no second-hand person. I want to know on my own. Is that so bad to want to be sure? Can you understand that? Jesus knew me and lo loved me. Especially because of my usual big, honest questions. He knew I had nothing. So when he came to us once, once again, he approached me before I had opened my mouth and said, Thomas, I'm here. You may end your doubting. Then I knew this was my Lord. Here is the risen Christ. I have found my Lord and God, Thomas. I have seen the Lord. Recognize me by now. I have spent much time with you, but you wouldn't know my voice, for I'm a writer more than a speaker. I wrote the book, I'm John, here to tell you once more that we have seen the Lord. We're ordinary people, as you can tell, ordinary in our loneliness and despair, ordinary in our impetuous declarations that we have denied later, ordinary with our honest questions and wavering loyalty. And most of all, ordinary in ways our relationships with Jesus kept changing shape. But the biggest change was recognizing and welcoming Jesus as our risen Lord. Jesus kept coming back and coming back with every parable, every sign, and then with every resurrection appearance to depend, to deepen our trust, to clarify our understanding and out of lack of understanding. I, John, have written so you will trust the risen Lord's love for you. The Christ won't let you go either. I wrote so you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We have seen Jesus, we have walked with Jesus, we have questioned Jesus, we wrote to you about this Jesus, the risen Lord has come to us. We have seen the Lord. Have you seen the Lord?
churches. The next will be a dramatic retelling of the Easter story. Uh, it's entitled, Were You There? Uh, it's just, as I stated, a retelling of the Easter story. On the, first, on the first days of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and said, Where do you want us to prepare the Passover meal? Jesus said, Enter the city, go up to a certain man, and said, My time is near. I and my disciples plan to celebrate the Passover meal at your house. And the disciples followed Jesus' instruction to the letter and prepared the Passover meal. After sunset, he and the twelve were sitting at the table. During the meal, Jesus said, I have something hard but important to say to you. One of you is going to hand me over to the conspirators. They were stunned and then began to ask one after another, It isn't me, is it, Master? Jesus answered, The one who hands me over is someone I eat with daily. One who passes me food at the table. In one sense, in one sense, the Son of Man is entering into a way of treachery, well marked by the scriptures. No surprises here. In another sense, that man who turns him in turns traitor to the Son of Man. Better never to have been born than do this. Judas already turned traitor, said, It isn't me, is it, Rabbi? Judas, Jesus said, Don't play games with me, Judas. Before the night's over, you're going to fall to pieces. Because of what happens to me, there is a scripture that says, I'll strike the shepherd, helter skelter. The sheep will be scattered, but after I am raised up, I, your shepherd, will go ahead of you, leading the way to Galilee. This very night, before the rooster crows up the dawn, you will deny me three times. Even if I had to die with you, I would never deny you. Stay here. The sorrow is crushing my life out. Stay here and keep vigil with me. My first prayer, my father, if there is any way, get me out of this. But please, not what I want, you. What do you want? Peter, can't you stick it out with me a single hour? Stay alert. Be in prayer so you don't wander into temptation without even knowing you're in danger. There is a part of you that is eager, ready, for anything in God. But there is another part that's as lazy as an old dog sleeping by the fire. My continued prayer, my Father, if there is no other way than this, drink in this cup to the dregs, I am ready. Do it your way. Once again, are you going to sleep on and make a night of it? My time is up. The Son of Man is about to be handed over to the hands of sinners. Get up. Let's get going. My betrayer is here. The words were barely out of his mouth. Out of his mouth with Judas, the one of the twelve, showed up with him, a gang from the high priests and religious leaders branching swords and clubs. The betrayer had worked out a sign with him. The one I kiss, that's the one. Seize him. He went straight to Jesus and greeted him. How are you, Rabbi? And kissed him. My friend, why this charade? They came up on him, grabbed him, and wrapped him up. One of those when Jesus pulled his sword and taking a swing at the chief priest's servant, cut off his ear. Put your sword back where it belongs. All who use swords are destroyed by swords. 
Don't you realize that I am able right now to call my father and 12 companies more if I want them? A fighting angel would be here and battle ready. But if I do that, how would the scriptures come true that say this is the way it has to be? What is this? As the mob takes me, coming out after me with swords and clubs, as if I were a dangerous criminal. Day after day, I have been sitting in the temple teaching, and you never so much as lifted a hand against me. You done it this way to confirm and fulfill their prophetic writings. Then all the disciples cut and ran. The gang that had seized Jesus led him before Caiaphas, the chief priest, where the religion scholars and leaders had assembled. Peter followed at a safe distance until they got to the chief priest's courtyard. Then he slipped in and mingled with the servants, watching to see how things would turn out. The high priest, conspiring with the Jewish council, tried to cook up charges against Jesus in order to sentence him to death. But even though many stepped up, making one false accusation after another, nothing was unbelievable. Finally, two men came forward with this. He said, I can tear down this temple of God, and after three days, rebuild it. The chief priest stood up and said, What do you have to say to this accusation? Jesus kept silent. Then the chief priest said, I command you by the authority of the living God to say if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Jesus was curt. You yourself said it, and that's not all. Soon you'll see it for yourself. The Son of Man stood at the right hand of the Mighty One, arriving on the clouds of heaven. At that, the chief priest lost his temper, ripping his robes, yelling. He blasphemed me. Wait, do we need witnesses to accuse him? You all heard him blaspheme. Are you going to stand through such blasphemy? They all said, Death, that seals his death sentence. Then, the prophet, then they were spitting in his face and banging him around. They jeered as they slapped him. Prophets and Messiah, who hit you that time? All this time, Peter was sitting out in the, wait, in the courtyard. One servant girl came up to him and said, You were with Jesus, the Galilean, in front of every, everybody there. He denied it. I don't know what you were talking about. As he moved over toward the gate, someone else said to the people there, This man was Jesus in Nazareth. Again, he denied it, salting his denial, denial with an oath. I swear I never laid eyes on the man. Shortly after that, some bystanders approached Peter. You have got to be one of them. Your accent gives you away. Then he really got nervous. I swear, I don't know the man. Just then a rooster crowed. Peter remembered what Jesus had said before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. He went out and cried and cried and cried. In the first light of dawn, all the high priests and religious leaders met with the finishing touches on their plot to kill Jesus. Then they tied him up and paraded him into the pilot, the governor. Judas, the one who betrayed him, realized that Jesus was doomed. Overcome with remorse, he gave back the 30 silver coins to the high priest, saying, I've sinned. I've betrayed an innocent man. They said, do not care. That's your problem. Judas threw the silver coins into the temple and left. Then he went out and hung himself. The high priest picked up the silver pieces, but then didn't know what to do with them. It wouldn't be right to give this, a payment for murder, as an offering to the temple. 
They decided, it, they decided to get rid of it by buying the potter's field and use it as a burial place for the homeless. That's how the field got called Murder Meadow. The name has stuck to this day. Then Jeremiah's words became history. They took the 30 silver pieces, the price of the one priced by some sons of Israel, and they purchased the potter's field, and so that they unwittingly followed the divine instruction to the letter. Jesus was placed before the governor who questioned him. Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, if you say so. But when the accusations rained down hot and heavy from the high priests and religious leaders, he said nothing. Pilate asked him, do you hear that long list of accusations? Aren't you going to say something? Jesus kept silence. Not a, war, not a word formed his mouth. The governor was impressed, really impressed. It was an old custom during the feast of the governor to pardon a single prisoner named by the crowd. At the time, they had the infamous Jesus Barabbas in prison. With the crowd before him, Pilate asked, which prisoner do you want me to pardon? Jesus, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus the so-called Christ? He knew it was through sheer spite that they had turned Jesus over to him. While court was still in session, Pilate's wife sent him a message. Don't get mixed up in the judging of this noble man. I've just been through a long and troubled night because of a dream about him. Meanwhile, the high priest and religious leaders had talked the crowd into asking for the pardon of Bar Barabbas and the execution of Jesus. The governor asked, which of the two do you want me to pardon? They said, Barabbas. Then what do I do with the so-called Jesus Christ? They all shouted, nail him to a cross. He objected, but for what crime? But they yelled all the louder, nail him to a cross. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere and, a, and that a riot was imminent, he took a basin of water and washed his hands in full sight of the crowd, saying, I'm washing my hands of responsibility for this man's death. From now on, it's in your hands, your judge and jury. The crowd answered, we'll take the blame, we and our children after us. Then he pardoned Barabbas, but he had Jesus whipped and handed over for crucifixion. The soldiers assigned the governor Jesus into the governor's place and got an entire bridge together for some fun. They stripped him and dressed him in a red toga, plated a crown from branches, thorn bush, and set his head, put a stick on his right hand for a sculpture. They knelt him before mocking revenge, bravo, king of the Jews. They said bravo, then spit on him, hit him on the head. With a stick, they had their fun, took off the toga, put his own clothes back on him, then they proceed the crucifixion. Along the way, they came on a man, Siren, named Simon, and they made him carry Jesus' cross, arri arriving to Goliath, the place called Skull Hill. They offered him a mild painkiller, a mixture of wine, myrrh, but when he tasted it, he wouldn't drink it. After they finished nailing him to the cross and were waiting for him to die, when wild away by the time by throwing dice for his clothes above his head, they posted the criminal charge against him, Jesus. This is Jesus, the King of Jews, along with him. They also crucified two criminals, one on to his right, the other to his left, people passing along the road Jerry shaking their head, heads in mocking limit. You brag that you can tear down the temple and then rebuild it. Three days, so bust your stuff. Save yourself if you really got son. Come down from that cross. The high priest, along with the religion scholars and leaders, were right there mixing it up the rest of them, having a great time poking fun at him. He saved others he can't save himself, King of Israel. He is he then let him get down on the cross. Well, all become believers then. He was so sure of God. Well, let him rescue his son. Now, if he wants him, he did claim to be God's son, didn't he? Even the two criminals crucified next to him joined in the mockery. 
From noon to three, the whole earth was dark. Around mid-afternoon, Jesus groaned out of the depths, crying loudly, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some bystanders who heard him said, he's calling for Elijah. One of them ran and got him a sponge soaked in sour wine and lifted it on a stick so he could drink. The others joked, don't be in such a hurry. Let's see if Elijah comes and saves him. But Jesus again, crying out louder, loudly, breathed his last. At the moment the temple certain was ripped into top to bottom, there was an earthquake and rocks were split in pieces. What's more, tombs were opened up and many bodies of believers asleep in their graves were raised. After Jesus' resurrection, they left the tombs, entered the holy city, and appeared to many. The captains of the guard and those with him then saw the earthquake and everything else that was happening were scared to death. They said, this has to be the Son of God. Could the church say anything? Diana wants both the same thing. But can I tell the story just a little bit different? took him from judgment hall to judgment hall. But they could find nothing wrong. But what they forgot, Sunday morning was coming. They played dice. They played dice. They shot dice for his clothes. But they forgot Sunday morning was coming. They made whips metal on the ends and they beat him till his skin was ragged. But ma'am, they forgot Sunday morning was coming. The Bible says that his eyes were bled. But they forgot Sunday morning was coming. They thought they could end the whole day and make sure that he would never ever come back, Steve. So instead of a normal crucifixion, they nailed his hands to the cross. They nailed his feet to the cross. They made sure he would not come down. But what they forgot is Sunday morning was coming. The officers, the officers, military men, Beat him, beat him as they put him on the cross. But then they made a mistake, Terry. They raised him up. And the word says, if thou be lifted up, I'm going to draw all me unto me. So he gave up the gold. As he hung there, they mocked him. They, they gave him elder rust. They gave him, they gave him vinegar to drink instead of water. Because they had forgotten Sunday morning was coming. And the young, the young, the youngster said that Mary Magdalene and those went on Sunday morning. <laughs> They went early. They went early in the morning. The old song used to say, while the dew was still on the road. 
And on Sunday morning, on Sunday morning, on Sunday morning, he got up. He got up. Won't you get up this morning? Won't you stand to your feet and praise him? Won't you bless his holy name? It's Sunday morning. It's Sunday morning. And let me tell you, let me tell you, some of you, some of you, some of you have had some Fridays in your life. Some of you have had some Saturdays in your life. But I'm here to tell you, there's a Sunday morning coming right for you. It doesn't matter what yesterday held. It doesn't matter what last week held. There's a Sunday morning in everybody's life. And y'all, I need to tell you, it's Sunday morning. Won't you praise him today? Won't you praise him today? Won't you bless his holy name? Oh, it's Sunday morning. It's Sunday morning. And somebody can shout because today is better than yesterday. It's Sunday morning. Oh, it's Sunday morning. And on this Sunday morning, we give three appeals as we do every Sunday.